what happened today? Because I know you you were trying to explain that you had a confrontation at, at the Capitol. I just want to because I don't know what's going on. I, I know you might have the video. I like if you do, I like we'd be excited to see that here soon. But what what just happened and what um why was you a little bit riled up when you called me earlier? <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, after my exchange with Corey Bush, where first of all, I was trying to get people to come and the I think like the more people like us or like you have um, a Feeney is down there who is uh, Fred Hampton leftist. And a lot of people who watch this show are starting to come down. And I'm like, the more people like that, that come down, the more this can become something that goes beyond a very meager demand for an extension of something that is a product of the problem that we need to face down. And so I wasn't, I was just going to ask her one question about forced to vote because I knew that she wasn't going to, I just, I had a feeling that they don't have a good answer to that. And the rhetoric they've been using is that they need to get all of these members back so they can put their names down on the record so we can see who is for evicting Americans and who isn't, um, which is a great tactic. AOC said that. She straight up said that yesterday. And I was like, that's a great tactic. That was forced to vote. That was the idea. And so today, actually, there's been more engagement with people more on, I would, whatever you want to call them, the radical side, the grassroots activist side are coming down, having these kind of exchanges, including with AOC. And AOC actually brought up Force the Vote today. I interviewed some people who were talking to her and tried to explain her decision. At least like she gave an answer. Like I wasn't even allowed to get an answer from Cori Bush. And they treated it like this whole hostile thing. And, but but my I came in there today just to document what happened. I was like, I got to get back to get on Fred Hampton leftist. Um, and then and Jesse Jackson shows up out of nowhere. And Jesse, Jesse Jackson. Jack yeah, and uh, Jesse Jackson is, you know, I don't know if this might be the it, it, it's it's tragic. This might be the last time I see him. I grew up in DC. I would see him everywhere. I'd do little photos with him. I remember in third grade, I took a photo with him and he showed up at the Venezuelan embassy to support us when we were fighting off the right wing coup forces. He delivered food there and broke the barricade. And uh, he was not, it, it, he was, he was, um, he was struggling today. He sat, was sat down in a chair in front of the Capitol. And then out of nowhere, Adam Schiff walks in, Representative Adam Schiff, one of the most pro-war Democrats, the guy who just ran the Russiagate theater for four years, instead of talking about housing, instead of talking about healthcare, instead of talking about Donald Trump's uh, trillion dollar tax cut. And the guy who just supported every war that Jesse Jackson opposed. So he did a photo op with Jesse Jackson. Then they did a prayer with Jesse and he was laying hands on Jesse Jackson which just disgusted me. And I was like, whatever differences I have with AOC, this is another level. And they're letting him, they're posing for photo ops with him. And he's trying to be, work his way in with Corey Bush. And she was accepting all of his, you know, congratulations. Cause this is Corey Bush's big moment. And I just walked up to him one, when, when Jesse left, I didn't want to interrupt that. And I said, uh, Representative Schiff, uh, how about reallocating $4 billion from apartheid Israel to free housing for Americans, the apartheid state you support with all your heart? And he looked at me at first, then he pretended I wasn't there. So I just kept going. I was like, is there any war you haven't supported? Because Jesse Jackson opposes all the wars you support. What about your attack on free housing in Venezuela by sanctioning the Venezuelan people? You know, What about Cuba? V Jesse Jackson put himself on the line to uh, try to start normalization with Cuba. You support an economic war on Cuba. And just going down that route very vocally and loudly in front of everyone. And this was different because Cori Bush's people didn't step in to stop me. Uh, and I could tell they were kind of, they were torn because they were agreeing with what I was saying. And then one of them walked up to me and she was like, okay, we get it. We get it. Fuck Israel. Okay. But can you not do that here? And then this, um, blonde white woman. I don't think she worked for Cori Bush. I'd never seen her before. She was carrying a giant Starbucks cup, walks up to me and starts screaming at me, get out of here. You cannot do this. This is not what we do here. And I'm like, well, how is the war state not connected to the war on the poor? Like this is all connected. This is what MLK talked about. These were his four evils. And 
this is what Jesse Jackson always talks about. And you're telling me I can't talk about this here? And a number of the people there were visibly uncomfortable. Two congressional staffers, these two dorky little guys came up and trolled me and they're like, are you Max Blumenthal? Why do you obfuscate the Chinese genocide against the Uyghurs? And like, so you have that whole crowd there. Then you have a growing radical left contingent that was like quietly or was supporting what I was saying, was starting to heckle Adam Schiff. And yeah, then I was like, I got to go do this live stream, but the video should be up soon unless I, can't I, wait decide, to see unless I decide I look like a complete psychopath, but I haven't watched it yet. But I, I was like, wait. I was pretty heated. I, I was asking him like, where's the DNC hard drive? <laughs> you know, see, is I Vladimir love hit him. responsible for the eviction crisis? <laughs> see, that's why I love uh, you guys at the gray zone. Cause I love that you hit him with like real substantive um hard hitting like undeniable uh like accusations of what the democratic party stand for yeah. and that is what something that we've been a shock to the consciousness of the liberal mind at fred hampton leftists because they love to use the black community as props we're the people that both stand there during the photo shoot so people would think that they have pro-black pro policies meanwhile me following the teachings of fred hampton and mok like you brought up because I connect, I connect how militarism is connected to white supremacy. So I'm telling you people, if you're supportive of massive military budgets, you are not anti-racist. If you are supportive of giant police budgets, if you're supportive of this capitalist state that's, that relied on slave labor to exist, you are not anti-racist. So that is, that is exactly the true bomb that you brought to them. And it seemed like it made the liberal crowd very uncomfortable, something I'm very used to. <laughs> like once yeah. I explain yeah. to them that their party is actually complicit with white supremacy. A lot yeah. of people they misunderstand my problem with the Democrat Party because there, there are some black people that they will say, oh yeah, the Democrats, they don't do enough for black people. I'm like, yeah, that's one thing, but that's not my problem. <laughs> my problem is not just what they don't do for our community. It's what they actively do to our community. The Democrats it, are the party of the police state. Joe Biden bragged about creating civil asset forfeiture which is a mechanism that siphons wealth from our community. And we are affected at around the 60 to 70 percent rate. Yep. yep. So it, that's that, their policy. I'm going to pass it right to you, Max. But their policy are complicit with white supremacy. And that, that's the true bomb you, brought, you dropped to them. And they, yeah. it makes them really uncomfortable. Yeah. I mean, what is the point of us being here, even in this country, if we're not going to take on people like Adam Schiff? I mean, it's getting more and more uncomfortable to live in this country and to be here at this point uh, with <laughs> the way that COVID is being handled. I'm not going to offer my opinion on it, but I just think everyone feels incredibly uncomfortable about what's going on now. And no one knows what expert authority to trust. Um, and then beyond that, we, we have won the title again and again, the United States as the world's largest exporter of violence. And it's people like Adam Schiff soft-handed little chicken hawks who have never picked up a gun. This little pencil neck, he, he, his face was all full of Botox. He was all ready for a photo op. He looked younger than I did, even though he's like 30 years older than me. And he was just there and they welcomed him there. And uh, I even got some flack from people who were self-described uh, self-described communist about how like maybe this wasn't the right approach because we need to bring more mainstream people in to get our message across but it's like what is the message what yeah, are they asking swear. for <laughs> what are they asking for they're just asking for and this this and it gets really confusing from this point on they're asking for an ex a, a moratorium on evictions until the deadline expires again and then we have to be here again maybe in the winter when nobody can come out to the capitol not a cancellation of rent, not a freeze on evictions, but another extension. And so the Biden administration says, we don't know what to do. Uh, the Supreme Court has said that there's nothing we can do because they always have someone to blame. Uh, and definitely, the, <laughs> yeah, the Supreme Court definitely deserves blame here. I mean, it is an anti-democratic institution populated by people who are literal corporate projects. Amy Coney Barrett, Brett Kavanaugh. These are people that come from the Federalist Society that exists to create these corporate puppets who rule as judges for the rest of their lives. They'll probably outlive me and if, if everybody here continues to live. Um, and then you have, but Biden blames the Supreme Court and then they kick it down to Congress. 
Congress runs away for recess. They show up at the Capitol. Nancy Pelosi then says, okay, I'm going to do something for Cori Bush and AOC. Uh, we're going to call for the CDC to give an eviction moratorium to issue it on the basis of the Delta variant. But the CDC, according to the Supreme Court, can't do it. So then the Biden administration discovers that, oh, wait a minute, we can give a 30-day extension so people can not get evicted for 30 more days. Maybe they can pack their things. And Jen Psaki's out there saying, we are encouraging landlords not to evict people. Like, thank you. I'm sure they're really going to listen to you. Um, and so what is the demand? Like, what, what are we fighting for? Like, it's unclear out there what we are fighting for. And Occupy, it was clear. Prosecute the banksters. Uh, this is an, it was an anti-capitalist protest from the beginning. Yeah. And I'm willing to give, um, like Cory Bush and the squad credit whenever they actually fight on something. But my, my criticism is how effective are you doing? What is your plan? What is your strategy? Because like me personally, I don't even agree with the strategy of taking over the Democratic Party. But a lot of these times when I talk about these issues, I'm actually approaching it, um, accepting your, your guys' premise. Oh, like, okay, if you guys want to take over the Democratic Party, what has to be done? And I'm like, okay, even if I buy what you guys are selling that we got to take over the Democratic Party, I see what you guys are doing. I'm like, how are you guys building political power this way? I explained earlier how the Biden administration has pretty much been emboldened by pretty much because the progressives fall in line with them. They say, hey, the progressives support us. Now we got the mandate to expand the, the police state. So where are the victories? Or, or, or where, what, can you, what are you guys showing based on the strategy you guys are laying now? Like, even if I was to accept your guys' strategy. And that's why you bring up how the fact that, they're, yeah, they're there. They are showing up at the Capitol. But what exactly um, is the focus moving forward? Is that right, Max? Well, at this point, and, and, and I'll be looking at the comments, and you can correct me if I'm wrong, and we can name many things Biden can do. The Biden administration can get away with claiming that they can do nothing about this moratorium because of the Supreme Court. And so it just the system is just working perfectly according to plan. And then there's this protest out there that is demanding Congress come back. And it's, it's literally a forced to vote protest at this point, because their criticism of forced to vote was that the votes aren't there. So why force everyone to put their name on the record? Obviously, they just didn't want to challenge Mama Bear because it would require Pelosi bringing the bill to the floor. And so in this case, they're trying to get Congress to come back and vote, knowing that the votes aren't there because the Democrats are overrun with corporatists who are paid by big developers. Um, and so they're not going to vote for this. They're not going to extend the eviction moratorium. The votes are not there. And the Republicans are marching in lockstep with the most odious, rapacious forces. So it just confuses me. And I go there to talk to different people about what the strategy is and what the agenda is beyond that. And I don't, I'm not getting anything clear. So why accept someone like Adam Schiff in your ranks? Like, what are you trying to get from there? There were other members of Congress there wearing suits who are more mainstream. Like they're starting to show up because they realize it's a good photo op. And this is kind of like Cori Bush is someone who's very well liked. She's getting a lot of media. She's on MSNBC. DC local news is covering this a lot. The issue is resonating with the public. So they want their photo op, but they know nothing's going to happen. And it's just like every time this happens. They know the Senate parliamentarian is going to say you can't raise the minimum wage. They always have a way out. So again, it's another situation where they have a way out. And I'll tell you something interesting I learned, and AOC should be asked about this. She was having a conversation with some young activists, some really impressive young activists who've come down there. And one of them told me that she said that she is considering leaving Congress because of her frustration and going back to grassroots organizing. Wow. Like, so is that like, I remember hearing that rumor. Is that something that she's still like thinking about? Or is that something that just that she said I'm passing or? Well, I wasn't there, but I'm just telling you, she is saying that to people. Maybe it's something she's saying, just like when she was running, how she, she said she was willing to be a one term congressperson just to. Um, yeah, they talk a good game. Oh, yeah. And I mean, the rhetoric you would hear you, if you were there is it's it's very radical rhetoric. Yeah, they and this is 
what they have done. And I was very lenient to the squad for a very long time, but I was sitting back watching. I'm like, I just want to see the results of what's going on. And it seemed like AOC and the squad and Corey Bush, it seemed like what they're doing, they are shifting what it means to be a socialist to the right instead of actually dragging the party to the left. And they are actually being shifted to the right and they are closing the Overton window on what is allowable discourse. For for example, like you see uh, LC, like she mentioned the serial, bo serial bombings under Trump, but under Biden, she's not allowed to talk about that. You also see that there's like a coordinated blackout on issues of like Julian Assange, Stephen Donzinger, uh, like, okay. like, and like, there's like certain things they are not allowed to cross, and it's like, how not one person say something about this? So that's why I'm like, is it coordinated? Like, do you guys have an email chain where you got, all right, we can't talk about this issue, we're not to talk about this issue, and you know, there was like this big LC confusion on Cuba. Like, these are like just simple uh, things where if you're like a real leftist, you should be able to get these things right. Like, well, how is there a, a, a struggle? And there is that main divide there where we, we're just calling it out like well, how, how are you guys not seeing this and people are allowing themselves to be shipped to the right because they see what they're talking about and they're like okay this is how far left we are going to go but then we i've seen these same people who are who are like loyal to alc and bernie and the squad i see them like attack julian assange and their supporters and i feel like they do that because they want to like paint anyone who advocate for that issue as being crazy as a way to cover for them for being weak on that issue I see them like they attack tankies and people who call out U.S. imperialism because, once again, their side is weak on U.S. imperialism. And we discuss this on Fred Hampton Leftists all the time. And this is what we promote. Like, a lot of people don't understand. There's like a new divide on the left. There's the new left and the old left that's still like stuck behind. And they're not actually fighting like the national security state. And, and in fact, they're prop they're propping it up. What's your well, thoughts, Max? Yeah. I mean, Tulsi Gabbard, I've a lot of criticisms of her, especially since she left Congress. And but she took on the national security state and immediately was labeled a Russian agent. I mean, yeah. mainstream media, NBC, Hillary Clinton. I mean, the the character assassination was extreme. And so, you know, I heard Jamal Bowman two days ago. He was speaking and he's like, we're here to stand against white supremacy and colonialism. But he's not standing against colonialism. I don't even know if he knows what that means. And I think he understands that these words like pull well among his youthful base. <laughs> it's just so empty. And then AOC was sounding like, uh, you know, she was ready to run up in Congress. She was sounding like, it, it sounded like January 6th. She was speaking yesterday and she said, there's a school of politics that says you have to be gentle and nice to get what you want, but I don't subscribe yeah. to that. We need a confrontation. We need to confront Congress. And she was, I was like, all right, so you're going to like run us up in the Capitol? Like, are you ready to be the next <laughs> Ashley Babbitt? Like what is going on here? Uh, obviously she wasn't. And that is rhetoric that takes the energy out of radical struggles and then subverts it. Uh, in It transmutes it into this increasingly mainstream site of protest that has become a Photoshop for people like Adam Schiff, who is the moral equal of Mike Pompeo and any of these Donald Rumsfeld and any of these monstrous war state figures that everybody universally despises, who's a progressive Democrat. So they are smart in a certain way because they know how to play the game. They use radical rhetoric, but they are trying to work within a very violent capitalist institution and doing the best they can. And so you don't take on the national security state. That's one thing you don't do. And you don't start saying things like cancel the rent or nationalize the healthcare industry. You don't take on Pelosi. You just don't do, and they know that. So they're preparing for a future. Cori Bush is the most honest one. She's the most, it's clear that she's taking this stand because she's trying to stake out her position as the most radical one. But then you have what I saw today where more mainstream members of Congress trying to kind of bring Cori Bush back in and saying, look, we support what you're doing and we're gonna, this is good for us. It's getting energy out for us, but it's not gonna go anywhere. Um, and so yeah. what is the point of being in Congress then? What yeah, is the so, point? Yeah, like it seems like there are activists who are scared to talk to other activists and journalists. Like, isn't that what, what Biden them done? And once again, like you said, Cori Bush tends to be the one who put her out, herself out there the most. And this is like the second time where there was like a revealing moment, mostly because she kind of put herself out there. I, me I remember the first time 
um, where she was responsible for people realizing the squad doesn't vote as a block because she famously asked about that. And she was like, oh, actually, uh, like Yanni Presley said, we all vote alone. They were, they were like, what? That doesn't make sense. That doesn't make sense. So, like, once again, my criticism comes from the play, place where I accept your guys' premise, where the, where the premise is that there is ways that you guys can push the Democratic Party to the left. And what, what we are criticizing you guys for is that you guys are actually not being effective at doing that. So when you asked Cory Bush about force the vote, it seemed like there was a direct misunderstanding about the ask. And I know she she is she obviously very smart. AOC and them, they're very smart. They understand the concept. Because I explained this on my show before, and this didn't get a lot of coverage. But Cory Bush forced a vote on whether we should give voting rights to convicted felons, and people didn't flag down. And I'm, I remember she made a tweet, and she was kind of she was trying to cover for the Democrat Party in the way that she like framed the tweet, but it actually was a damning uh, uh, like incident for them because she was like, "Oh, we had uh, we there was a floor vote that we we forced that uh, where ninety Democrats voted for." Uh, convicted felons getting their voting rights back, but then a one accurately point out in the comments, they're like, okay, that means over half the Democrats voted against that, <laughs> so right. half the Democrats are exposed right. for not being for voting rights. That's why people are not going to convince me that Democrats are the pro democracy party because look how many uh black men and other people lost their voting rights because of the policy that Joe Biden and Kamala Harris implemented in the Democratic Party because Cory Bush forced the vote was exposed as being supportive of the new Jim Crow still to this day. Over half of Democrats voted for black people not being, or anyone who's a convicted felon not being able to vote. So if you're voting, if you're against that, how can you say you're the pro-democracy party? 